In this video, we'll take a look at the number one mistake that beginners make when it comes to financial planning. I've worked with quite a few junior FP&A people and I've noticed the same mistake over and over again. Many beginners think that company performance and income statement are almost synonymous. So whenever you ask someone to budget something or to prepare a financial model, usually beginners take the route of only modeling the income statement. And there have been many instances where I've seen such models then be left unchecked for far too long. Usually there are three main reasons to prepare a financial model. You're either looking for investment and uh, you want to show a huge growth to potential investors or you're trying to secure a loan and you want to show a healthy growth to the bank or you're doing it for internal planning purposes. And in many companies, you have all three of those and they can look significantly different when it comes to the hockey stick growth. So we tend to overestimate our projections when it comes to uh, presenting them to investors because we want to get them excited. And at the same time, when we're doing it internally, we tend to underestimate our growth so that we can easily achieve it and perhaps get a bonus. And that's where a lot of beginners get it wrong. They just grab the income statement because they think it's the same thing as performance and they slap a growth percentage on top of it and they're done. And this can lead to a lot of issues, especially because by only looking at the income statement, it's sometimes hard to see how unrealistic our projections might be. Therefore, it's extremely important to always think about the income statement together with the balance sheet and the cash flow statement. And I'm going to show you how modeling the three statements together can help you with an Excel example. But before that, let's take a look at the simplified diagram outlining how the three statements correspond to each other. Here we have the income statement up here. And uh, the first thing that uh, we have as a link is that the net income from our income statement is what goes to our balance sheet and builds out our retained earnings the accumulated profit or loss that we are uh, generating. But the same figure, the net income, is also the starting point for our cash flow statement if we're doing it in the indirect method, which is more common in terms of uh, reporting. Another thing that uh, happens in the income statement is that we recognize depreciation and uh, amortization. And this directly impacts our balance sheet because it reduces the amount, the balance of our uh, PPE, our property, plant and equipment, and also our intangibles. Remember, depreciation is for PPE, for uh, material assets, and amortization is for intangibles. Connected to this is uh, this here. So those are our CapEx, capital expenditure, and our depreciation and amortization directly go to our cash flow statement. So depreciation and amortization is an adjustment, a non-cash expense that gets added back to net income. And then we have our capital expenditures, which is cash outflow related to purchasing new assets. Another thing that goes from the balance sheet to the cash flow statement is the changes in working capital. So this is the net changes in our short-term assets and short-term liabilities, essentially accounts receivable, accounts payable and inventory. This also adjusts the net income as a starting point to get to our cash from operating activities. And especially when we're modeling, the last step is that as soon as we're done with the cash flow, it gets us our cash balance for our balance sheet. This is a really simplified overview of how the three statements link together. There can be a lot of other things. For example, you can have uh, share capital being issued. So it would be on the balance sheet, but it would also go to the cash flow statement as a cash inflow for the capital that was uh, paid in. Then you might have debt. Debt would be on the balance sheet, but uh, the interest related to this debt will be on the income statement and also any repayment or utilization of debt balances as well as payments of interests will be in the cash flow statement. You can have different investments like investment properties or maybe even uh, acquiring a company and generating some goodwill and uh, those will be on the balance sheet but they will also play a part in our cash flow statement. So if we pay for an investment, it will show up here even though it has no impact on our income statement. We can think of other examples, but uh, this chart here represents the main links between the three statements and how they work together in order to provide a cohesive, well-informed picture of the business. Let's take a look at uh, how 
this all works in Excel and why it's really important to look at the tree statement as a whole. Here, I've modified one of the tabs in this model from my uh, financial modeling course that's linked in the description down below. It's available for free on YouTube, so feel free to check it out. What we have here is the regular, typical income statement model that a lot of uh, junior financial analysts first make. So what would usually happen is uh, your manager would come and they'll say, yeah, we need to know how our uh, company is doing in the next five years. So go ahead and uh, build me a model. Immediately when you think of performance, you almost always only think about income statement. And that's where a lot of issues uh, come from. So for example, here, what I have is I have my income statement drivers. I have the revenue, cost of sales, the operating expenses. You see, most of those are moving averages, but uh, for revenue, we have some growth targets, which is fine. Then for cost of sales, we're seeing that it would actually decrease as a percentage from revenue because we're changing the mix and uh, moving to higher priced products. And then we're seeing that uh, we are realizing some economies of scale and uh, therefore salaries and benefits are decreasing as percentage of revenue. And this all looks good. All those are like moving averages, which is fine. We then have our income statement and we see that we're performing amazingly. So from 70 million, we're going all the way to almost 300 million in EBITDA over the next five years. And that's great. That will get slapped as a target you might even end up sharing it with uh, investors or with uh, lenders. And uh, that could be a huge problem down the line because a lot of times when we're only modeling and forecasting on an income statement basis, we're actually arriving at pretty unreasonable performance targets. If we grab the same assumptions and we build out our three statements for this use case, you see how things start to look quite differently. I have the same thing here, same assumptions. The only thing I have is I've added depreciation, uh, interest, which we don't have here, and then uh, other non-operating income. Those are all moving averages, and I have my taxes here. But then I have additional schedules. So I have my cash conversion cycle, which is essentially calculating my networking capital and the change in networking capital, which I'll need for my cash flow statements. Then I have my uh, property plant and equipment, and I've modeled it really simply here. So I'm modeling depreciation as a percentage of revenue, and then I'm modeling uh, CapEx, so acquisition of assets, to the purchase of property plant and equipment as equal to this amortization, which essentially keeps the balance of PPE at the same level. So we're not expecting any huge expansions in our company's asset base, but we'll still need to replace different assets and charge some depreciation to those that we have. Then I also have an equity schedule and the retained earnings uh, are calculated here as well. And you see, I'm not issuing any equity. I'm not uh, paying any dividends. So it's a really, really simple model. But just by adding those few things, most importantly, the cash conversion cycle, we can go ahead and apart from our income statement, also build our balance sheets down here and our cash flow statement. And immediately we start noticing some issues. So for example, the first thing that I'll notice here is that even though growing our EBITDA from 70 million to 280 million seems a bit of a stretch, it's still doable in a, in a fast paced company, but growing our cash balance from 33 million all the way up to 400 million of cash in the bank, that's really not reasonable and uh, really wouldn't make sense to go with this to an investor because uh, they'll just tell you, okay, you're generating all this cash. Why do you need money? And the first thing we really need to think about here is if we will be generating this much cash, it probably won't just sit on our balance sheet. So are we paying out dividends? Are we making more investments? Maybe we need to actually invest a lot in our asset base to be able to reach this growth in revenue and in EBITDA. Maybe we need to build out an entirely new production facility just to make sure that we can get this decreasing cost of goods sold that we're planning for here. But you see how this essentially allows us to get a bit of a better picture. And uh, here even I would argue that this is not okay. We, we should be investing way more if we want to grow 
to this level. Maybe we'll start paying some dividends just to make sure that this cash is utilized. There's no point in this cash just sitting on our balance. We can go even further and uh, look at things like, for example, accounts receivable. So right now we are ending the year with 22 million of receivables and we plan to increase that to 53 million. This is in line with our sales, but would it be manageable? Would it be manageable with the same team? Because we're trying to realize economies of scale in our salaries, if you remember up here. So maybe that's that's unfeasible with uh, this team. And uh, we may need to grow the team a lot in order to support this growth. And one other thing in the balance sheet is, if you look here, we're ending with 17 million in inventory. And we're planning to grow that more than two times in the next five years. And it makes little sense that uh, we'll be able to do that without expanding our warehousing, which again comes back to this property plant and equipment staying the same seems more and more unrealistic considering the growth that we're projecting. So if we're projecting like a 5% growth here, then it would all be fine. So we're growing a little, we're increasing some prices, changing the mix a little bit. Probably don't need to invest a lot in like a new warehouse or new production facility. But with what we have modeled here, it's evident that uh, this won't work in this way. And that's why it's extremely important to always look at the three statements together to make sure that uh, you're not just modeling something that's completely unrealistic and uh, you would never be able to achieve. I hope I convinced you that you should not be looking only at the income statement as a synonym for uh, performance. You should always think about the three financial statements together because it allows you to pretty much do a sanity check check on your income statement assumptions, especially the ones related to like hockey stick growths. And if you're interested in financial modeling, you should check out this playlist step by step from a blank Excel page all the way through a complete dynamic financial model. So if you want to learn financial modeling, this is uh, where you should click next. See you there.